Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Richard. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Richard. Um, that's the brain dates May 1st, 2014. Uh, so I got a little over five years. I got a sponsor. And I used to have a bunch of sponsees, now I'm down to one. Um, and um, so what it was like. Um, I grew up uncomfortable, I, and I didn't realize how common that was. Um, I grew up in punk rock, so that was, I thought that was normal for kind of kids of that generation. But it turns out a lot of us are uncomfortable. My whole life I felt uncomfortable. Um, my dad was a pipeliner, so we moved around. We followed the pipelines. So my background also, we were always moving around. So I never had long-term friends. I never really had roots, it seemed like. And I was a little mentally unstable, too. So I kind of grew up in this cocoon. And so I wasn't looking for alcohol, but at an early age, I tried glue. I tried gas. I tried a lot of this stuff, like, to get out of myself. I got into exercise when I was 13 or 14. I did that just absolutely fanatically. I did everything like to an excess, um, trying to get out of myself. I'd read eight hours a day. I would watch TV eight hours. Everything I did, I was kind of looking for an out. And um, then I found it at about 15. I drank with a swim team at a drive-in, and it was awesome, and it was game on. Um, it was the first time I felt free. I've heard people that say they don't remember my their first drink, but I remember my first drinks. Like It was just kind of life-changing um, because I do everything to an excess. I couldn't drink like a normal person. I had, I could not drink at all. Actually, I just, I overshot the mark. So I, um, like a good alcoholic, I got into speed. So I did, <laughs> so I did speed for like the next two years. And the consequences were I got kicked out of my house at 16. Um, and my life just went to shit really, really fast. Um, I got into punk rock at the same time. And it was a great combination um, when I was a kid. Did that till about 89. Um, well, I went to my first AA meeting at 17. So I went to live with my best friend. His parents adopted me. And um, his brother's friend took me to my first AA meeting at 17. 16, I knew I, was, I had issues. 17, I finally hit the rooms once. I went in, a bunch of old guys talking about God. I got in an argument with them after the meeting, uh, which I, I did actually in this term of sobriety too. I argued with, argued with my first sponsor all the time. And... Um, he said, if you don't believe in God, you can't get sober. You can't be an AA. So my second meeting was when I was 43. Right. And I spent the, that whole rest of the time trying to learn how to drink. Moved up here in 89. Haven't done hard drugs since 89. But I couldn't figure out how to drink. Um, I go on and off. And what, what, what worked for me is I started traveling with bands, and I had a really unstable life. That's how I grew up. And I was able to... That was enough of a distraction for a lot of years. I could drink a little bit. I'd go with the band, I'd drink, and I'd be sober at home, or I'd, or vice versa, or I'd, so, or I'd be sober on the road and drink at home. I think I did that twice. But I, I did that for a long time, and that actually worked. Um, I, I've always been a little mentally ill, but mostly depression, and it was enough forward movement to get me out of my depression. Um, when you're going to the next city, you can't sit down and not move. Um, you're always forced to move. And that, what I realize now is that kind of allowed me to be a functional alcoholic. And even when I wasn't drinking, there were times I didn't drink. I was still an alcoholic in hindsight. Um, I quit touring, and that's when I kind of kicked off my drinking. And I remember, too, just like I remember my first drink, I did my last tour, and I was literally felt poisoned from, from drinking. And I remember that first day, I was kind of excited because my pattern was I came home, I would quit drinking. And that whole time, that last tour, I thought I was going to go drinking for a little while, dry out. I remember I went to the store and I bought, I bought beer. And it was game on for another 15 years. And I uh, started a business, and I had a pretty good life. But that business allowed me to drink on my own. And I learned how to, I've gone through four trades. I learned how to drink in all of them, except for my last one. Mm-hmm. And um, at the very end of that, my wife's family kept dying. Because I was married for 17 years. And... Uh, Every time she would leave town the last couple of years, I'd, I'd be alone in the house. So a good example is I would overeat in the beginning. The second to last time she left, I stayed in bed and drank the whole time. 
And that's what my life looked like at the end. I had worked myself out of my union job. My business was failing, and I was drinking in bed any time I was alone. The last time she left to go go take care of her um, grandmother who was dying, um, I couldn't face that bed again. I didn't know what to do. I've been trying to quit drinking for off and on for years. It got harder and harder and harder. And when she left to the airport, I realized that I, I didn't think I could stop. I always thought I could stop before. You, no matter how hard it was, I kept trying. And this time, I didn't know how to do it. So I, I went to my first meeting. The guy in my union had been offering to take me for months. Um, and I kept on saying, I got this. You know, it's not a big deal. And I finally went to the meetings. You know, it was the first time I had been sober um, during the day. because I was morning drinking by then. Um, and I went to that first meeting Tuesday night at 6.30 over at Central Office. And um, I raised my hand and said I was an alcoholic. And um, I haven't had a drink since. And it's been it's been a pretty awesome ride. Uh, I see two people I saw my first week of sobriety, which is Brad and Rebecca. And they both greeted me like they were old friends from almost a different life. And um, I, my life has changed a lot. I did the hard way. I didn't get a sponsor early on. My first sponsor I fought with constantly. I had to have like outside influences kind of make me surrender. I had a fire in the warehouse. My business was to kill two people. And that was the first time I called my sponsor. You know, I really called my sponsor. I didn't know what to do. I called him at like 5.30 in the morning and I went to a meeting. Um, I had another one where I got in a motorcycle accident. This is all about like the different steps. I, I was having an issue turning it over after that too because I do like to control stuff. Got hit by, by a car. Hand was facing the wrong way, broken ribs. But then back of the ambulance, I was still trying to control stuff. I was telling the cops not to tow the bike. I was trying to direct everything. <laughs> and I, I realized I had this moment of clarity, which I've had a few times in my life. And I, I actually let go. It was like this physical release. And I allowed the, them to do, do their thing. I carried that into the program. I started working the steps after that. Um, I changed sponsors. My whole life sort of changed after that, but I needed sort of those out, that outside pressure to teach me how to turn it over. And um, now my life is pretty awesome. Like I still do seven meetings a week. Which, um, that's what I did when I was sober. I started the 90 and 90 and just kept doing it. Um, I've got three commitments, which are awesome. If you're new, if you don't have a commitment, it's the best thing I've done. Second best thing. I've got a commitment at this meeting. I remember being at this meeting five years ago. You have to raise your hand under 90 days. I remember raising it every week and just so excited when I got to 90 days because I was so uncomfortable I didn't want to raise my hand. Hmm. And I have a commitment at this meeting, which is awesome. The first meeting I got sober at, I have a commitment there. And um, I've got sponsees. I've got down to one sponsee, but that's the other thing that really changed my program, too, is daily contact with other alcoholics. So I'm in contact with sober alcoholics every day, but I also reach out to my sponsees and other, other people in the program. Um, and my life is awesome. Every day I wake up. As an atheist, I still pray. In the morning, I do, I do reading. Um, I work with my sponsees to get a morning program, too, because that helps me. It gets me right every day, so I wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I, I, I don't go too off the rails. Um, I run the apprenticeship program in my union. It was the same job that I couldn't function at anymore. I didn't do, I never drank there, but I had so much, so many, so much resentments there. I couldn't face to go to work there. And now I run the apprenticeship program with 150 apprentices. I don't like meeting new people. I'm not that good of a leader. And now I'm a leader. I'm in daily contact with 150 people and I'm training to do this trade. Uh, I deal with the other 600 people in my union for training. Like it, it's something that, it's not showing up, it's, just, it's, it's not me. It's not the person I was. And like through the last five years, I'm kind of discovering that person that I was a long time ago, the person I could have been, you know, without the mental illness, without the alcoholism. And um, so far, it's been a great ride. And the fact that I'm up here, I can talk at a semi-normal pace. And when Chelsea asked, I immediately said yes, is a miracle. So thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm an alcoholic. Ashley. Jesus. Okay. <sighs> Hi. Um, all right, so I go to 8.55. Okay, great. Um, it's really good to be here. It'll be better when it's over. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try um, to share my experience, strength, and hope, and we'll see what happens. Um, my sobriety date is September the 12th of 2011. Um, that's a little over seven years. Um, it is... Not my first sobriety date. Um, who knows if it'll be my last. Um, hopefully it will be. 
and um, and I was trying to think of like what what it was like, what happened, and what like what it's like now. And um, well, first of all, um, thanks for the ten minute share wherever he went. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> that was awesome. I related to everything that you said. Um, I didn't make it quite as long as you drinking, but um, I related to all of it. And um, yeah, like like you, like before I even started drinking and using, I, I wanted to change how I felt. Um, I remember when I was when I was really young, um, I got into this thing that I don't know how we ended up starting to do it, but it was called, we called it fainting, where you basically have someone just hold your veins on your neck up against the wall until you literally faint. Um, I loved it. I loved it. You blacked out for like a minute or two and you woke up and I, my whole body was just kind of pulsing and it was great. And, um, <laughs> and I tried to do it all the time. I tried to do it to myself. It didn't work. I would let go before I fainted. Um, but that was, I just loved getting out of myself. I needed to get out of the here and now. What I was, the reality was so fucking uncomfortable for me. So uncomfortable. I hated it. The restless, irritable, and discontent. And, um, yeah, and eventually some non-alcoholic friend of mine told their parents that we were doing this thing and ended up break, stopping the whole thing. So it was ended badly. Um, they're like, you could die. Um, and I was like, I don't care, you know. Um, and so, and I guess the other, um, the thing that's kind of important about my childhood, because I won't, I won't talk about that, is that I was just, like I mentioned, so uncomfortable. I had so much social anxiety, especially, um, and social interactions between people. It was just so hard for me. I don't know why, but I just felt, I just couldn't understand how people did this thing and how people interacted with each other and how people talked one-on-one, -on -one, especially that was the hardest one-on-one -on -one interactions. There was no buffer. There was nothing. And, um, I was, the only thing that really made me feel better was, um, when I was younger was things like, um, fainting, getting out of myself physically, passing out, or like, um, I did sports and I liked doing it and I was really good at it. And, I could get out of my head for an hour or whatever it was. And so that's really what I focused on was doing that sports. I could, I didn't have to talk to people like the normal interactions. I could just whatever. And so that became the focus is it's actually the only thing probably next to drugs and alcohol and sobriety that have made me feel like the most okay with myself. And, um, and when I was 15, I started, drinking and using like being a really socially anxious person I wasn't a I wasn't like the cool kid I wasn't I wasn't invited to parties or all that stuff so I got it when I could and when I was 15 and I um I still remember um that first time drinking for many years I told the story of my first drink which was a lie it was I think when I first got sober I wanted it to be more dramatic than it was so um but I ended up yeah, it was very dramatic, and I wanted it to be so, like, the second time I drank was very dramatic, and there was a lot of consequences and whatnot, so I made that my first drink, but I was recently um, reading my journals, and I ended up reading them and burning them. That was also dramatic. Um, that was a couple years ago, but I realized that my first drink wasn't that. It was another time. I flipped them, but anyway, equally... Um, it just tells you that if I tell myself a lie long enough, I will start to believe it. I really do. And I've done that my whole life. Um, but I remember, like you said, I remember distinctly my first drink. And I remember how it felt. I felt um, I was at a sleepover with some teammates. And um, the parent, their parents were said, uh, we're going to go out to dinner for a week back in a couple hours. I, I said, why don't we? drink while they're gone and we ended up selecting Tanqueray gin and creme de menthe and mixing those together um and I remember it was horrible but at the same time like I remember feeling it you know go down my throat and down and it, and it just radiated throughout me and I just remember like the fear that I had had and held on to my whole life just kind of evaporated off my skin and it was just fucking magical and it was and I was like all of a sudden that anxiety, that fear was just gone. And I was just happy and I was, could do what I was doing with the people I was doing it with. And I was, was fine. And I just, I wanted to do that as much as I possibly could. And, um, I ended up like 
calling two girls that were seniors on the team and having them come over and I remember just being funny and entertaining and it was just that was it I was like this is it this is the solution this is it this is what I want to do and and um that you know a couple weeks later the whole dramatic thing happened um the alcohol poisoning and the puking and the blacking out anyway but that year that first year I started drinking and using a lot as much as I could and um, I started, yeah, then smoking weed and then taking pills. And in a very short period of time, like, things changed a lot for me. Um, and it was, like, that year, it was, like, I started, ended up going to a therapist that year. I remember um, going to my first psychiatrist that year. I was on psych meds. I, you know, my grades started tanking. Um, I, I quit one of my sports teams, and I uh, um, started, you know, having sex. I started... Um, like getting in fights, like it was just like my whole personality was just like, boom, and it flipped over, and um, and and I just did that as much as possible, um, because that was the solution. Even though it was causing these problems, it was like I always said, like, you know, like if you're gonna go, like if you go on a day trip to the beach, you know, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get sandy, like you're gonna get sand in your shoes and in your clothes and in your car and like shit like that but it's worth it because you go to the beach right and like it's beautiful and it's spiritual it's powerful it's fun and and you expect the sand like everything all the consequences for me were just sand it was just like I didn't care about all the shit it was just a means like it was just a thing that happened but I get to do this other thing and I get to feel okay in the world and that's all I wanted and um I was 17 I moved up to from San Diego is where I was raised and I moved up to Berkeley and like um I truly felt like I had arrived here. I decided to leave this socially anxious, nerdy thing down south in San Diego, and I was going to reinvent myself. I was going to be this um, party girl. I was, you know, say yes to everything. I was, um, you know, adventurous and um, exciting and all these things, and I tried to do that, and I um, and um, that worked for a little bit, and I... Um, I remember alcohol, that was like when it was working for me. And then you talk about like it, it working for us for a while, especially when, you know, at the beginning, it like, it does what it's supposed to do. And, um, and that lasted for a couple of years. I was able to get off my psych meds because alcohol and drugs were my solution. And I started doing other things, you know, and I started, I found cocaine, I found amphetamines, I found, um, you know, the Adderall and, and the hallucinogens and I started the benzos, I started mixing everything together and doing all these things um, that made me feel okay in my skin. That's that's all I really fucking wanted. And um and um what happened though um was a really quick decline over the next four years of being up here um in Berkeley and um doing what I wanted to do. Um it was a quick decline into, like, psychosis, basically. And um, I, hold on. And all the drugs I was doing and all the, whatever, um, all the, the booze I was drinking, and combined with my anxieties, that started to come back. I was mortified when they started coming back while I was drinking and using. And it was like, wait, what? This is, this is the solution. And, and they started, um, I would be so drunk and I couldn't drink away that fear. I would be having panic attacks while I was drinking, which was unheard of. And, um, and, and then I started like losing my mind and I was, um, like I had this, I don't know why I, I like to scale buildings go on top of buildings when I was drunk at night and, um, I would climb the sides of, of buildings and be up on the roof. I think I didn't want them to get me. So like on the roof, you kind of have a good vantage point. Um, and I would get up there with like a knife and a lot of cocaine. If I fell asleep, they would get me. So, you know, I had to keep doing the coke, which made it worse. And I, you know, I started seeing people that weren't there and I could see ghosts. I thought I was a medium. Um, I could see ghosts. Um, I also thought that I had, uh, I could see into the future, but my power, it was, I could only see into the future three seconds, <laughs> um, which is not 
that hard actually to do but I thought I was really powerful and just my brain just I couldn't handle like reality I just the, they talk about in the book you know you separate the you can't separate the truth from the false as an alcoholic and your alcoholic life becomes the only normal one and I just was okay with this it was just like the sand and and um yeah I remember like one time like going into the bookstore at UC Berkeley and um, going to the metaphysical se- metaphysics section and I stole stuffed my backpack with like a bunch of um, like time travel books and like wormholes and you know like re- theories of relativity and I, th- I like stole them all because if I had paid for them not that I had money but they would like know that I knew too much and like I just I was just insane and I couldn't keep it together and um Hiding from people with cell phones, um, which is really hard to do. I thought they were the feds and and stuff like that. And and really, like, it became clear um, to other people, I should say, that I was an alcoholic. Because um, I was in heavy, heavy denial um, about, about what was going on. And, like, to a reasonable person, what I was doing, the behaviors I was exp- um the behaviors I was, I don't know what the word is, whatever, and um, uh, all led, like, to, like, alcoholism. Like, other people saw it. They've been confronting me with my drinking for a long time, and um, but I have this, like, heavy, heavy layer of denial that I can put over anything in my life, and I can still do it um, to a much less degree now, but, um, like, it was very, oh, yeah, so, like, for example... To, to give you an example of how much in denial I can be, I had been um, sleeping with in, in long-term relationships with women for four years before I realized I was gay. <laughs> that is hard to do. <laughs> That's hard to do, but I did it. Um, I really didn't know. Um, <laughs> and that's what it was, it was like for drinking and using. Like, I just didn't know, and I was the last to know. Um, and... <laughs> But it was obvious, and, and I didn't know what an alcoholic was. That's the other thing. I didn't grow up around alcoholics or alcoholism, and um, I grew up a lot around a lot of dysfunction, but I didn't know. And so, like, I didn't know. I had this image in my mind that that wasn't what I was, and, and come to find out in the rooms here, like, alcoholism is, like, this three-part thing, right? It's, like, this this physical allergy, and, and I didn't understand when I first heard that what allergy meant. Um, I know I just say to people that I'm, like, sponsoring or whatever. It's just, like, an abnormal reaction. Um, so I have this physical abnormal reaction where when I start drinking, I want more, period, um, or using anything uh, mind-altering. Um, and I want more, and I can't stop. It, something physically has to intervene with me, usually me passing out. Um, I like to, at, like, a house party, I used to, I like to, like, lock myself in the only bathroom of the house and then pass out on the floor, like, with the locked door. Um, and I, like, had to physically be separated from alcohol um, or drugs to stop doing them. And um, the second part of the alcoholism, which I didn't know about, is, like, this mental obsession. And, like, so basically all, I'm, all I think about and all I want to do is thinking about the next drink, how I'm going to get it, where it's going to be, who is it going to be with, what is it going to be, Um, what do I have to do between now and then, like, or, you know, actually, you know, taking it. And I just, and what happens is even if I stop drinking for a period of time, my mind will convince me to start doing it again. And every reason that I had, and it talks about this extensively in the big book, every reason that I had becomes like foggy and hazy and I can't quite grasp it. Like I did, you know, the morning after whatever that happened, like that was so clear then. And now I can't quite grasp onto it and all the reasons why I shouldn't go away. And, um, and I'm obsessed and I, and I, uh, I start drinking again and I start taking a drink that I can't stop taking. And, um, it's this fucking cycle. It's this very vicious cycle. And then the third part is the spiritual malady. And I, I definitely relate to that. Um, I kind of, that's harder to define, but it's, for me, it was like a vast emptiness um, a vast feeling of disconnectedness, disconnection, disconnectedness um, from everybody and everything. Um, I definitely have been suicidal. 
Um, I had been for most of my life or since I was 15. Yeah. My, oh yeah. I skipped that too. I was, had like a big suicide attempt and, um, through my drinking and even into sobriety, this like existential discontent with life in the world. And no matter how many people were surrounding me, no matter who was around, it was like, I, I just felt empty. And, um, I, I, so I definitely, when I came to AA and I heard about these things, like I identified immediately and I've never, I'm not one of those people that go back and forth whether they're an alcoholic or not. I know exactly that I'm an alcoholic. I relate to everything in the big book and what all you say. Um, when I first got sober, it was more like, do I care enough about myself to do something about it? Um, not whether or not I'm an alcoholic. Um, so anyway, um, what happened? Let's see. So there was a lot of, uh, really, I had like a, a sports team again. I had a, like a, I lived in a house with eight other girls. Um, I was like 21 years old and, um, I had like a coach and, and people were around me. So like, I wasn't alone. So people could see what was happening to me and wanted me to get help. Um, I had a lot of public displays of alcoholism <laughs> that, um, that were unavoidable, really, um, that I wanted to just go into a dark hole and disappear forever and not think about. Um, the only way to do that was to do something even crazier the next day or week or whatever. Um, but so people started putting pressure. Like like um, you said, there was outside pressures on me, and they made me, like, choose between um, going to this support group at the university. It was like I could go to the harm reduction group or the abstinence group. And I was like, harm reduction sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and I could still drink. Um, and I started going to that group. And I remember it was led by, like, a social worker and, like, a therapist and some other people, public health. I don't know. But we had this group. It was, like, maybe 10 or 15 people every week. And um, it was not AA. Um, and so... One time they, and I would go, and I was just like a disaster. People were like mortified. The reaction to like the things that I thought were normal was like mortification by on other people's <laughs> face. But one time they were, they had these laminated words um, like on the floor. Like they had printed out a bunch of things. Um, they were all like adjectives, feeling words, and things like that, um, descriptors. And they we did this like exercise where they would, say, like, how do you feel when, um, like, you're at a party, or how do you feel the next morning after whatever, and the first thing they, whatever they asked, I remember looking around, trying to vaguely participate, and I saw the word cursed, and I, <laughs> and I just picked up the word cursed, and everybody, like, after every time, would put their word back, and, like, pick another word to describe it, every single time, I just picked up cursed, and I really felt that way. That's how my life felt, and it's funny now, but <laughs> thanks, Nikki. Um, but I felt cursed, and I felt cursed because I couldn't, like, now that, like, like, like when I was drinking, I, it was fucked. Like, things were so chaotic. I couldn't control what would happen. I would humiliate myself. I would embarrass others around me. I would hurt people around me, like, um, and then I couldn't. When I was sober, I was sober, and that was a, that was awful, you know. And I was irritable, discontent, restless. I was crawling out of my skin, and so I really felt. And what I didn't, uh, that talks about too later. Like it talks about the jumping off place where you can't imagine your life with alcohol, and you can't imagine your life without alcohol. And that's where I kind of was. Um, and I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know about the program. I didn't know anything. Um, and I just was in this place of feeling cursed, and that's kind of what happened um so let's see uh this this part what happened is is very fuzzy for me like I don't exactly remember but I remember that this girl on my team a couple years back um had taken a semester off and she went to rehab and then she came back and she was no fun anymore and <laughs> she did not party with me anymore and she had gotten sober and um, she started going to meetings in the um, area here. And I, um, so she 
was the roommate of my girlfriend. Her, they lived in the same apartment, and so she saw a lot of this up close and personal of what I was going through, what I was doing, and she started talking to me about AA, and I don't, again, it was very fuzzy, like, I don't really remember it, and for the life of me, I do not know why I agreed to go to an AA meeting with her. I cannot imagine what I was thinking to agree to do that, because I was also very, um, I was a devout atheist as well. Um, I thought that, I thought that, um, God, I thought AA, I thought all this stuff was just, just crap, and, um, but for some reason, I don't know what it was, but I agreed to go to a meeting, and I remember going with her to this meeting, um, it was Sunday night, it was me and Dana House, it was 8 o'clock, it was February of 2009, and we were a couple minutes late, and it was raining, that's all I remember, oh, and the topic was God, um, <laughs> and there was a blonde woman talking in the front and she was so cheerful and happy and her topic was literally god it was like the worst topic for like me i was just like oh my like what is this and um i had also been up the whole night before on speed um and like i remember just sitting oh, we were late we just, i had the only seat was in this piano bench and i was just like gripping the bottom of the piano bench and just like oh my god um just couldn't wait to get out of there and but I started, again, I don't know why, but something about it, I just started going to a couple meetings. And this part was is, is um, very hard to remember, but um, I do remember that all, you know how they talk about fun, fun with problems, and then just problems? I remember that most of the time uh, there was a lot of consequences and it was dramatic and, you know, tragic and all these things embarrassing and but there was still some fun parts and I remember like I would hold on to these small little moments and decide that that's what made all of this worth it you know and and after I started coming to meetings it that was gone um it would ruined every bit of drinking and using that I had from then on out it was just for oblivion uh, all it was was drinking and using for oblivion um there was no more of that, that it talks about like reclaiming the moments of the past in the book. Um, the joy, that freedom, that all that was gone. And so, um, the next couple of months going to AA, I also had this horrible awakening that I couldn't stop drinking and using. I always thought that if I'd wanted to stop, I could, but I never wanted to. So when I was starting to try to do it and I couldn't, I was, it was more baffling than anything else. Um, and then I started getting mad about it. Um, and after a couple of months of doing that, I remember one night, um, it was April 22nd of 09. And my, for a while now, my roommates and people stopped offering me drugs or alcohol. They hid it from me, you know, cause we were in this house and they were trying to be respectful. And, um, and, but I remember hearing them say that there was these, leftover pot cookies from 420 mind you it's the 22nd so they literally couldn't finish it i, I was like flabbergasted that they had <laughs> leftover cookies for two fucking days um that they didn't somehow consume between eight people <laughs> but anyway i heard that and my brain just looked like ding i have been sold for a couple of days and and as soon as i left i went and stole one and i ate it and and I remember calling my friend, my um, person that brought me to my first meeting, and I asked her if it counted, like, as a relapse or not. And I was like, she's like, yes. I was like, no, I didn't even smoke it, though. I just, like, ate the cookie. And she's like, yes, that counts. And I was like, well, okay. I hung up. I was like, fuck it. And I went to the store and got a 12-pack of Pacifico. And um, that night ended in a five-point restraint um, after I valiantly tried to fight a couple EMTs and firefighters that had just broken down my door um, because of um, I had taken, like, handfuls, like, five. I was on five psych meds at the time. I took them all, a bottle of Tylenol PM, the 12 Pacificos, and uh, laid down and wanted it to just – I didn't want to necessarily commit suicide. I just wanted it to be over. Like, I wanted this to just end. I was in so much distress, and I just wanted it to be over. They, they At the hospital, they kept saying I wanted to kill myself. I was, val like, disagreeing with them the whole time, but I, I just wanted it to go away. And, um, if I died, I died. And, um, and 
So I went to the psych ward, well, the ER or the ICU for a while, and then the psych ward for five days. And I got out of there, and they gave gave you a bunch of pills when you're there. So I didn't go through any withdrawal. Um, But I got out of there on a Monday, late Monday night, went to bed. While I was in the psych ward, I had a I had gotten a sponsor, and she, I didn't know it was the counselor at a at Thunder Road, um, a rehab just here an adolescent rehab she was like had had this little intervention kind of with in my i think my mom was there my girlfriend was there a friend um my like sponsor and a couple people and they all had this thing and they were like decided for me that i was going to go to rehab so i had to go to rehab on a friday and i got out on a monday went to bed i woke up on tuesday and i was like all right all i have to do is make it to friday and i'm going to go to rehab and you know whatever and by Wednesday afternoon, I was using again. Um, I couldn't fucking do it. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't. It was just reality is just I, the curse of, of the alcoholic. It cannot stand sobriety after a certain amount of time. And at that time, I was I could not stand sobriety. And um, so I go into rehab and um, and something changed. I know people talk about it being like a ten thousand dollar big book or whatever. Um and to an extent that's true, like just on its own, it won't do much except keep you in another place for 20, you know, however many days. Um, but for me to be physically separated from it and kind of um, take me out of that environment that I was in it and, and give me enough time for like the, the, the like rational part of my brain to come back. Um, it, it helped. And at some point during that time, all these people that have been trying to get me to get sober and all that. Um, there was this guy, he was this old dude. He was like in his seventies, late seventies. And, um, he, I just would fuck off in rehab. Like I was like drawing on tattoos on myself. And I had this little, this little coasty coast guard chick, heroin addict friend. And we were just like vandalizing shit and like making fun of the counselors and trying to undermine everything. And, and one day in group, he was like, he told me, he was like, he looked straight at me and he's like, the first time I got sober, I was your age and I would do anything to get the last 50 years of my life back. And he's like, I've been in and out for 50 years. And I, and then, you know, and he's still, he was in there and, and I, something about that just like washed over me. And I was like, holy shit, like, this is not a joke. And this is, this is a fatal progressive disease. And, um, um, I started taking it seriously and I started doing the things that were suggested of me and it from then on, um, till now I've been doing this deal. Um, and that was 10 years ago and I'll get to my relapse in a second. But then, um, what happened as an alcoholic for me is that things got a lot worse before they got better. I was taking my my coping mechanism, my solution, right? The problem isn't drugs and alcohol. The problem is that my solution is drugs and alcohol. Um, that's, and that was my experience. As soon as that went away, I had no solution. I had no tools for living. It was right back to being 15 and like my social anxiety just like ramped up. Um, I had no, I didn't know how to live. Um, while, you know, it was just, it was just horrible while I was in rehab um, it was like May to mid June of while I was there, all the people in my house, um, cause four years is, I guess, a normal amount of time for people to go to college. Um, <laughs> they all graduated and moved away. Um, my girlfriend I had was not, was, um, not sober. So I broke up with her. I had nobody, basically no friends, no girlfriend, no place to live. Um, I, I was just like, thrown into the world. I had no idea how to do it. And, um, I first sober living house. I went to this place. Um, it was like a down on Dwight. It was this sober living place. that doesn't exist anymore for reasons that will become clear. But basically, um, we were just like a madhouse. And, um, then one night there, there's like these evi- eviction notices on the door that the, the manager and the owner kept taking down and they kept putting them back up. And they were like, oh, don't worry about it. And one night they were like, had a house, emergency house meeting. And they were like, so you have 24 hours to vacate the premises. Um, we're all evicted. Like, basically, I, you know, haven't been paying the mortgage. And 
And the rumor was that he's, he's been using this whole time, this sober guy had been directing and he'd been using and using all of our money that we were paying him. Um, and we had to leave. He's like, the sheriff will be here in 24 hours. And we were all, and then he left. He, the manager stayed there in the house with us and he left. He was out. He was still sober, I think. But, um, and that night was a party. Let me tell you, um, someone found speakers, um, alcohol there was like it was like a fucking chaos and um someone the guy that had been um like got his meth pipe out and i remember sitting on the bed and it was me him this my roommate and this other chick and they started smoking it and they tried to pass it to me and i passed it the other way just by myself a little bit of time and it went around and went around went around and, like, by the time it was here, like, it was, like, the decision. It was, like, I, I remember feeling, like, this is, like, life or death. Like, this is this is it. Like, this is what I need to do. And I just remember yelling at them to get out. And I um, I made, like, the first honest decision, like, first decision to for sobriety for myself that night. Um, made him get out. Everyone basically relapsed that night. I locked myself in my room. And then the next morning I got – I moved into my car. And I lived in my car – and went to AA that summer, and um, and then I was, like, on, and I, I was, like, this is, like, I, what I want, you know, this is the thing, and it was a mess, and I was really sick, and I was, um, I was, it was horrible in a lot of ways, but somehow I believed you guys when you said that, like, it's going to get better, and if you keep doing this thing, things will change, and things will get better, and I wanted what you had, and I started doing the things that you did to get it, and, um, and things started changing again, like the things I did in early sobriety, like in early sobriety, I would say is a loose term, like probably like three or four years. were just, just really cringeworthy. And I hate looking back at some of those things, but like, um, I kept coming back and I kept doing the thing and I got a sponsor and, um, and started doing the steps to the best of my ability, which was not, um, was not what I can do now. I can say that for sure. And, and I, and I just started taking suggestions from other people, which was huge. And I never had done that before. Um, and I started taking contrary action, um, and like doing what I'm doing right now, contrary action, doing things I don't want to do that I know to be good for me or that other people tell me are good for me, you know? And, and, at two and a half years, I had gotten into this really bad motorcycle accident, and um, I was in the hospital with a, a ruptured spleen, and they put me on um, morphine. I was on my way to the International Conference of Young People in AA in San Francisco with my buddy who was sober, and we got in a motorcycle accident, and we were in the hospital, and I got put on this morphine drip. I was in there for like four days or something, and... Um, they put me on the drip because I couldn't stop moving long enough for them to take a scan. And, and then what happened was I got out and they gave me some pills, um, Norco's or something like that, some painkiller. And it was already in my system and I had no defense against that, that drink. And that first day I was out, I started taking, I took one, I had this whole schedule planned out of like when I was going to take the anti-inflammatory, when I was going to take this thing, when I was going to take this thing and the antibiotics and I had a schedule and I was like going to stick to it. And like, I took one pill and then I was like, well, if I take this one now, two now, I'll skip the next one. And then I'll, you know, and then I was like, well, if I take three now, I won't take any until I go to bed. And then like, and then all of a sudden, like the reasons for drinking, and like, I just couldn't, um, I didn't have any offense against it. And I just took way, way more than prescribed. And um, I know now that I just didn't take the first step fucking seriously, as seriously as I should, which was that I'm powerless over drugs and alcohol. I thought that making a schedule was going to, was going to like keep me from overusing the, you know, the drugs. And I ended up changing my sobriety day. That's the only thing that happened. I, that was one of the hardest decisions. Another decision of my sobriety was that next day when I was on day zero. And part of me was saying, well, fuck it. You had two and a half years of sobriety. Sobriety was the most important thing in my life at this point. I went to 10 meetings a week. I had commitments everywhere. I was sponsoring two people and it was just like gone, right? My sobriety was gone. It was going to be so easy for me to just 
pick up like, at least for one day, get loaded like I wanted to, you know, and I, and I didn't. And this, and I, that really taught me, and that was September 12th or 11th. And then, so my sobriety is now September 12th, 2011. And that really taught me the meaning of one day at a time because, and I hadn't really quite grasped it before. And it was like, this day is the day we make a decision not to drink. It's not tomorrow. And, it, and, and like, it seems simple, but like that has carried on with me until now that like, this is literally a one day at a time program. And it's very simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. Um, and, and things like that over time that didn't, that I said at the beginning and I heard people say have started to make sense over the last, you know, several years. And now like, um, now things are 180 degrees different from when I came in. Like I literally felt cursed and I hated myself deeply. I hated everybody else. I hated this world and living in it. Um, and to, to a point now where I am at ease with myself that I can allow people to love me and love other people that I can do things that are good for me, even though I don't want to do them and like be an adult about things. Um, I'm definitely like a runner. I, I would, I will avoid and run away from everything. The three big ones were like responsibility, accountability, vulnerability. Those were like no, no's. Um, <laughs> And now, like, I can do that. I can have a job. I used to just, uh, like, I could get jobs really easily. And then as soon as they asked me to do things like show up on time, it was like, oh, okay, um, I'm going to have to go to the, you know, move along. Um, you know, things, and I've, I've just grown up a lot. I've grown up in these rooms, and I've grown up watching all of you do what you do and doing what you do sober. And I found, like, this, like, freedom and, and I, I remember someone telling me one time, like, um, cause my whole life had been about instant gratification and it was like, I want what I want when I want it. And when I want it is now. And, and just go, jump. It was like a long string of instant gratifications. My, my life was. And, and I remember someone saying one time, like, why settle for relief when what you seek is freedom. And I was like, and this is what I found here. Like that was relief and drinking and using was relief. It had no actual substance behind it. But here, this program, the steps, the higher power, the fellowship, and the recovery ultimately is like, is, is, is actually freedom. And it has depth and weight, like it talks about. It has like a backbone. It has, you can rely on it and it's real. And it's not this fleeting sense of instant gratification that I used to seek, um, well into sobriety with other, you know, I can use anything. I can be addicted to anything. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I guess I'll just close with, um, like, thank you for, you know, for keeping me sober, um, because I constantly find that I can't, I can't do something, but like we can, like, uh, like I couldn't stay sober on my own, but I found like once I got to you guys, like somehow, and I don't understand it. I don't know how the steps work. I just know that doing them brings about amazing results, and so I just keep doing them. And the more I try to complicate it, the more fucked up it gets. I just try to keep it like it was when I first started and try to listen to suggestions, and, and I found, like, this wonderful life. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.